Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Wethington. I'm director of the Arboretum here and talking about one of my favorite topics. I am a, a nut uh, about palms. I, I love them. They're just they're such striking plants. And, and I love cycads. But despite the title of this talk, I overestimated what I could could talk about in the time that, that we have. And so I've cut back to just cold hardy palms and we'll do a, a cycad one at a, at a later date. So sorry about that if you came here specifically for the cycads, but just wasn't gonna be able to get it all in at once. You know, palms are kind of an oddball in the plant world, very fairly primitive plants. They don't have, even though they're woody plants, they don't have that oh, woody tree. They, they don't have their, their vascular system like a tree. So you don't get those rings like, like, like in a tree. It's, it's quite different. If you've ever uh, seen the stump of a, of a older palm, you, you kind of know that. I learned that at a young age because my grandfather in Florida, that's where the only seats he had on his porch were uh, palm stumps. So it's, it's, it's quite a different animal. And they do range from everything from kind of small, low ground covering plants to really massive trees to uh, vines. They grow in the hottest, driest places in the world. Uh, they grow in standing water, in running water. So they really do hit niches all over from warm temperate gardens, at least uh, through uh, tropical gardens. You don't get them in, in cold temperate areas. I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the talk here. And uh, just to go on some of these, these cold hardy, hardy palms. I'm gonna give you some of these, you know, the jury's still out on quite on how hardy they are. I will give hardiness for them, both the kind of the generally accepted hardiness range as, as well as some other experiences I have. But you do have to remember that a lot of hardiness with palms has to do with their age. As they get older, they can become much more hardy than young plants. Young plants just don't have the, the reserves to withstand cold temperatures. And also, because many palms are solitary, that growing point right at the tip is what's important, the most important piece. And so if that area can be protected, a lot of times you can extend uh, the hardiness of your palms. And I'm happy to answer more questions about that as, as we get to the, the end. So, you know, put your questions in the chat or, or hold them to the end and we'll answer them as we go along. So kind of starting with the most hardy, the most reliable, and that's Trachycarpus fortunii. Trachycarpus, trachy means rough, carpus means fruit. So that has to do with the fruit. Um, there are about nine species. They range from India, Burma, Nepal, Thailand, China. And, and usually on trachycarpus, the trunks are covered in these coarse fibers. And usually you have separate male and female flowering plants, although that's not always the case. Sometimes you can get female and male flowers on, on the same, same plant. But you can see that there's a lot of variation. It's a widespread Trachycarpus fortunii, the kind of the flagship species. And this is it growing in the wild in China, where I've seen it in the wild. It can be quite different. It can be quite variable. It is found over a pretty extensive range in China. And you can see how different these plants appear, but they are both Trachycarpus fortunii. And you can kind of see that coarse fibers that clothe the trunk there. Trechicarpus fortunii. Fortunii is named for Robert Fortune, the great Scottish uh, plant hunter. This is probably the cold hardiest tree palm, and it can grow quite tall, grows up to 35 or more feet tall, and, and is, is a reliable uh, zone seven plant, assuming you're starting with a plant with a little bit of size to it. A seedling might not survive a, a cold zone seven winter. There you can see kind of the, that fibrous covering on the trunk that's very distinctive on, on trachycarpus. And you can take that fiber and use it to make things. This whole outfit from the, the shoes to the hat is all made from trachycarpus fibers. So 
I don't know how comfortable this would be. I'd be like wearing a, a burlap bag or sackcloth or something like that, but a hair shirt. But it is, you know, it is has been used in the past as for clothing and textiles. I probably nobody is buying that to wear anymore, but maybe to hang on a wall. I, I keep kicking myself that I didn't. I didn't buy that outfit. I would have liked to have taken that home and, and have that now from when I saw it in China. There have been several selections and, and palms are unusual in that most palms are difficult to, you know, these solitary palms like Trachycarpus fortunii that has a single trunk, you can't really get clonal plants. So a lot of these selections are seed selections. And so seed are collected from these and passed on. So this, there, there are several named ones and they're mostly named for locations to kind of denote uh, where they're from and kind of the hardiness. This is an old one called Norfolk that Bob McCartney from Woodlanders Nursery collected and named. But there's other ones, Taylor's Hardy. This is one from Taylor's Nursery here, I, I believe in, in Raleigh. And you can see that, that trunk covered in those hairs. And this is one that has withstood cold where that damaged other Trachycarpus fortunii in the area. There's one, another one we grow at the Arboretum called Bulgaria that obviously came from a garden in Bulgaria, which is quite hardy. You can see it here covered in snow. But where they grow naturally, they're often um, in the kind of snow zone areas. There's another one that's uh, sometimes separated as its own species as Trachycarpus wagnerianus, but it's never been found in the wild. It was really found in cultivation and is certainly a Fortunii. I, I don't think many palm experts nowadays would, would separate this out as its own separate species, but it is quite distinct. Trachycarpus Fortunii wagnerianus has very small leaves, quite small compared to typical fortunii like you see here, you know, those larger leaves. And so the leaves, because they're small, they tend to be very stiff and held kind of upright. It doesn't get nearly as big, only about half as big as tall as fortunii to about 15 feet or so. And it looks, it can look kind of odd as it gets bigger because the trunk grows up, but those leaves, the petioles and the leaves are all shorter. And so it's the top of the crown seems small compared to the, the rest of it. But it's, it's another good, reliable zone seven plant. It's still like Fortunii. There's a shot of a bigger plant. You can see those, how small the head is on there because of those smaller leaves. Now another species, Trachycarpus latissectus. Latissectus having to do with the sections on the leaf there. This is from India, kind of in the, the Sikkim region of India. It tends to have larger leaves than Fortunii. It tends to have more uh, segments to the leaves as well. These are young plants, grows to 20 plus feet tall. And because it comes from an area that's monsoonal in Sikkim, it really likes summer moisture. Some of these other plants are, are fine with real drought and conditions, but Trachycarpus latissectus really likes some of that, some supplemental summer water. It's not nearly as hardy. It's probably zone 8B at best. So uh, part of the reason I always really, I don't like uh, using zones so much is because it, that really limits how people use plants. There are plants that I grow that are not very hardy. So if I were gonna plant this plant, I would plant it right up next to my house, probably under some high shade. And, you know, some of that create a microclimate that would make that work here in, in Raleigh. And you can see here where it's planted by a wall to help it retain some, some heat. Trachycarpus martianus. This is Martianus is named for uh, von Mauritius, who's considered the father of palm botany. This is another one. It's probably 8B, and it's from kind of India, Nepal, Burma area. It's, it's a real interesting plant. It tends to have a much more slender trunk than Trachycarpus fortunii, but with really large leaves and a lot of segments. It can have as many as 70 
segments on the leaves. So it gives a very, very different appearance than Fortunii. Not super hardy, like I said, 8B, but, but quite showy in growth. Let's see a question that what does tracky carpus mean? Tracky is rough and carpus is fruit. So tracky carpus, rough fruit. And I haven't cleaned enough of the seed to really to know how rough the fruit are on it, but that's what it that's what it is comes from. Trachycarpus nanus, quite different than the others. Almost all the other trachycarpus are solitary trunked trees. Trachycarpus nanus, nanus meaning dwarf, is what is called a trunkless palm. Now, a lot of these palms that don't have trunks actually have subterranean trunks. They just kind of grow backwards. They germinate and a trunk will grow underground and the leaves will just show in a tuft right at ground level. But a mature plant of Trachycarpus nanus can have two to three feet of trunk underground uh, before you get to the, the roots. It's a real pretty plant. It's got kind of pale green to pale green foliage with glaucous whitish undersides, which you don't see a lot in Trachycarpus. It grows in Southwest China. I have I've yet to see it in the wild. I really would like to see it. It has small flower clusters that stand. The flower stalks stand straight up, which is unusual in Trachycarpus. Usually they're, they're arching. And uh, this has been reliably, pretty reliable in zone 7B for many years. Part of the trick is covering up that growing point with some mulch in its early years as it's establishing that subterranean trunk. So I'm trying to watch vestiges as they come in. Trachycarpuses are great pot plants, great container plants. You'll just, you would just need to be careful about leaving them outside in the winter. Trachycarpus fortunii is, is great. Trachycarpus uh, martianus be fantastic in a container, but would need need some protection over the winter. You'd need to bring it inside probably. Question about will these take full shade? Uh, yeah, Trachycarpus for the most part are very shade tolerant. They'll grow in sun to part to full shade. And where I've seen Trachycarpus fortunii growing wild, it's been in the shade. Now I've seen it kind of uh, abandoned in cultivation, uh, you know, that looks like it's in the wild in more open areas in, in Asia, but you can tell that it is not naturally growing there. So Trachycarpus nanus is generally three feet tall at most with the fronds at ground level is really been the biggest I've seen. Kind of a interesting plant. Trachycarpus princeps was fairly recent discovery. Its common name is stone gate palm, which is, comes from the village where it is. There's these two enormous limestone cliffs and it grows on these, these really steep, dry limestone areas on the Salween River. It uh, was really only described and named in, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And I'm told that it is, I have not had a chance to grow this yet, but it is a pretty reliable zone seven, maybe zone seven A plant with these narrow crowns and upright. It needs very, very good drainage though. And it's got very, very glaucous undersides to the leaves. That's one of the, the ID characteristics to it. That's why I put this, even though it's in a conservatory, this picture. So you can see those, those glaucous undersides to the leaves. It is apparently very quick growing. Although it grows on limestone, I, I don't think it requires a very calcareous soil, a very high pH soil. A couple more pictures of young Trachycarpus princeps. Really, it's a beautiful plant. I'm looking forward to really growing that for more years. One that is more readily available now, Trachycarpus tachyl. This is named for Mount Thackle which is where it was found growing. It usually starts growing from seedlings as a somewhat decumbent, which decumbent means laying on the ground and then turning up. But then in a short time after doing that, it'll grow more straight up to about 12 or 15 feet tall. 
it's a good solid zone 7b plant the leaves have more segments than trek carpus fortunii for years it was the wrong thing was grown as this plant so if you have an older plant of trek carpus tequila you really have to go back in and look and see if it's if it's the correct thing what happened was people were going to mount Thacule to collect it and they were collecting Trachycarpus fortunii there and growing it as Trachycarpus tequil. What was eventually discovered was another mountain nearby actually is where this plant was growing. And so if you see something called Trachycarpus fortunii nanital, that cultivar nanital is actually what used to be in cultivation as tequil before the correct thing got there. With age, the leaves get larger and larger, like I said, it has more segments than typical Fortunii. I am not a palm botanist, though. And there you can see another plant of Trachycarpus tequil with all those, those segments there. Mount Tequil is in the, the Himalayas. So kind of the next group you know, that we, we really know are the, the sables. The sable is, comes from an indigenous name. There's about 15 species. It's hard to speak with any confidence because palm biology is very complex. The sables tend to be very promiscuous, especially. So there are some hybrids that are out there. There are things that have been hybrids for so long that they're kind of becoming species. But these grow from North Carolina throughout the Southeast U.S. to Mexico, the Caribbean islands, Panama, and, and into Northern South America. One key feature of sables is the split leaf base. So you can see each one of these is a leaf base. And you can see how it is split, how it grows. It splits that leaf base as the trunk gets wider and wider. It doesn't start off split. But having those split leaf bases retained is, is a pretty typical ID feature. But they can be hard to identify. They typically have both the male and female flowers on the same plant, unlike Trachycarpus. So where they're really happy, they can seed around. And if you've grown sable minor, you may have experienced that. So sable palmetto, palmetto means small palm. This is one of the plants that grows from North Carolina down to Cuba, down all the way through Florida and into Cuba. It can grow quite large to 60 plus feet tall relatively stocky trunk. The leaves are what are called costa palmate. Now, Trachycarpus had mostly palmate leaves. All the, the, the fronds arise from that one spot. When it's costa palmate, it's kind of in between being palmate and being feather-like. And so that's why you get these kind of curling where the, the petiole joins the plant, it kind of is elongated and all the fronds come off of that. So it can, it's, its hardiness can vary quite a bit depending on where it comes from. And there have been people who have gone out for, for decades and decades in North Carolina and South Carolina after bad freezes and found the palmettos that weren't injured in those freezes and collected seed from those. And so Sometimes these named ones are more hardy. I doubt the Cuban forms are gonna have a whole lot of hardiness to them, but they can be as hardy as zone 7B, depending on, on provenance and perhaps even, even hardier than that. So like I said, sables are quite promiscuous. And so there are some that have, that kind of make people scratch their heads like the sable Birmingham which seems to be like a cross between perhaps sable minor and sable palmetto or sable minor and sable mexicana but it, it makes a short trunk plant but with long petioles slightly more palmate than in typical sable palmetto but you can sometimes find this selection available sable minor you know, I just came back from the beach last weekend and, you know, as you get closer to the coast and you look into those kind of swampy woodlands on the, the sides of the roads, the Pocosins, this, you'll see this palm growing all through there. They are kind of a shrubby plant. Minor means smaller or, or lesser, so it's smaller than, than palmetto. It is the northernmost growing sable and there's some reports of it 
historic reports of it, even into coastal Virginia that are hard to verify, but it may have ranged up that far. It makes mostly a subterranean trunk, again, a trunk that's underground. If you've ever tried to dig one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But they can form a trunk above ground up to, you know, four, five, six feet even on, on occasion. They are, I mentioned that word costa palmate. This is the costa. They're very weakly costa palmate. So more palmate than, than not. The flowers stick straight up and then they get loaded with these black berries. And sometimes it seems like every single one of those fruits will germinate. And by the time you see the leaf coming up from a sable seed, it has already put root down and they can be very difficult to pull out. But this is, this is maybe the most hardy plant, this and the needle palm. This is generally hardy into at least 6B, so you can get this pretty far north. Sable Mexicana, the Rio Grande palmetto, this Mexicana, obviously from Mexico, grows down along the, the Rio Grande. It's a, a really nice heat and drought tolerant form of sable with a, a stout trunk, grows to 40, 45 feet tall, probably best in 8A, maybe into 7B. A lot of these, like I said, you can, you can protect, if you protect that growing point, this, this is the part you have to protect right here. So there's some people who will wrap plastic around their palms over the winter or put a wire cage around there and fill them with leaves. I don't do that generally. There are really people who try and push the envelope. They'll, they'll wrap like Christmas lights around them. Got to get the incandescent, the, you know, small incandescent, not the LED lights. They don't, they don't provide enough heat, but the little Christmas lights and then wrap in plastic and things like that. I don't do that. What I'll do is I'll grow them in containers for quite a few years until they get to be a pretty good size and then plant them out and cross my fingers. And if while they're young, if we're, we're calling for unusually cold weather, sometimes I'll throw some branches just over the, the growing point just for, you know, a few days while the, the cold's coming. Another sable that's becoming more popular, sable urasena. This is the name comes from the Uris area of Mexico. The, the sometimes called the Sonoran palmetto. It's got a really nice blue green color. So it gives you a little bit of a different, different color there, especially when young, it loses that a bit as it gets older, but it can grow pretty tall to 20 meters or, or uh, 60 feet with a, a really, this is one of the stouter trunks It grow another third as, as, as in diameter over palmetto palms. It grows from Western Mexico and is, is a good 8A plant. The sables, other than sable minor, really prefer, mostly prefer more sun. Sable uracena will take a little bit of, of sun, I mean, a little bit of shade, but other than sable minor, you mostly want to plant these in, in a sunnier spot if possible. Sable guatemalensis, not very hardy. This is really more of a not zone nine plant. So sable guatemalensis, this grows from the Guatemala Island off of Mexico. It is a, it's a really great plant, but it, it's just not, not terribly hardy. So we'll, we'll skip over that. Sable Bermudana has, has always been interesting to me in that this is one that all these split leaf bases tend to fall off by themselves as it gets some age. And so you get that ringed trunk. It is from Bermuda, but has, has proven to be really surprisingly hardy to zone 8A. It's got simply massive costa palmate leaves, these kind of leaves that are folded over that give this really graceful appearance with, with age. It grows about 20 feet tall and with really, really stout trunks. I really think that we should be evaluating more of this sable bermudana as a landscape plant. I think it, it, it has a lot of, of potential. Not quite as horrible, hardy as the sable rosei after J.N. Rose, who originally collected the plant. It's, a, it's another Mexican sable, goes to 50 meters tall with a really narrow trunk. And it's, it's not super hardy. This is one that I typically plant up close to a house, probably 8B at, at best. 
I plant up close to a house, near or under high shade. It's one that I protect when it's when it's young, but be successful more often than not with a little bit of protection. But again, a sun lover. Okay, yeah. So here are the sable miners. So you know there are various ones. Apalachicola is one that you see pretty often. That's been that's been nice and hardy, even though it's from Florida, but certainly zone seven A at least. Sable Miner, Louisiana, sometimes listed as a variety, variety, Louisiana. This, this is one of the ones I mentioned that some Sable Miners will form a trunk. Some people think that this is a hybrid, but there seems to be a consensus that, it, that it's probably Sable Miner. This gets very large leaves, long petioles. It's a little like that Birmingham that I showed, and it's a really vigorous if it is if it is truly sable minor, it is it is perhaps the most vigorous one around, but still very very hardy. He's easily seven A, maybe six B. And sable Cosyarum, another marginal one for us. It's this is an eight B plant. This is the Puerto Rican hat palm. Grows in Puerto Rico, and considering it grows in Puerto Rico, it's it's quite quite hardy to eight B. It's interesting. We have a comment that says that Sable, Louisiana, does not not hold up well to high wind or high snow locations. That that I'm not surprised. It's got very large leaves, and would would be correspondingly could break apart under that. But when we're getting very cold weather, not necessarily high winds, with some of these, what I'll do is rather than I'll throw some pine straw on the crown, and then I'll take some rope or bungee cords or strapping and I'll pull the leaves all in together and that helps both with snow and it keeps snow from from sitting on that that crown and that that seems to help pretty often yeah sable minor apalachicola was the one before and there are other ones like bluntstown dwarf which is a smaller growing one there's a sable minor from oklahoma curtin county oklahoma so there are some some ones that are that are quite quite cold hardy. And this is a cultivar of a sable palmetta, Lisa, which has very distinct fronds, leaves on it. They don't divide quite as much as as typical. I don't know if it's if it's more cold hardy or not, but it's it's certainly interesting. So oh, that was supposed to come out. That's not very hardy at all. That's a zone 9B, so sable myaniensis. So uh, we'll skip over that. Sable minor hatteras, another good grower. This one will sometimes form a, a trunk above ground. Sable etonia, this is another Florida sable. Etonia is the type locality. They call it etonia scrub. Uh, and there's a certain group of plants that grow in, in that. This can have a very large subterranean trunk, sometimes as much as eight or nine feet. Usually just has about three to five leaves, very strongly recurved with that costa palmate center which which occurs in like that it's an 8b plant or so but i've seen it growing in stretched into other areas uh, especially that subterranean trunk gives it some added hardiness once it grows in but it takes a while to get there if you grow these in containers they will often as with, the, with these subterranean trunks they'll also they'll often pop plastic containers and break pots as they as they age and, and go go through those. I like to go when I'm whenever I'm down south along the Gulf Coast, I like to go through and visit nurseries and you find these things, you know, and they're they're growing through their pots and and you can often get a good deal on them because people don't want to repot them. So they'll sell them to you because they're outgrowing their their containers. All right. Another very hardy palm is rapidophyllum. Rapid means needle, phyllum means uh, leaf, so kind of a needle leaf. There is only one species in this genus, so rapidophyllum hystrix. Hystrix means resembling a hedgehog, and I don't know if you think that resembles a hedgehog, but we'll show you what does on the needle palm. So this grows in southeastern U.S. There are some historic accounts of it occurring naturally all the way up to D.C. We haven't been able to verify that. There aren't any good herbarium specimens from up there, but there have been reports that it, it may get up, up that, that far. 
but it grows in the southeastern U.S., from, from North Carolina at least, down into Florida. I grew this in a cold zone six garden in Blacksburg, Virginia. And once it got past, you know, just being a couple of leaves into a, a little bit more of a, a sizable plant, it's done very well there. I know somebody else who's growing it there. It does, it can burn during the winters a little bit in, in a cold zone six garden, but generally is fine. Some plants will grow kind of as sparse single plants. Others will sucker to form clumps. It just seems to be differences in individual plants that will do that. The one thing they all have in common is at the base, if you go in there, it's kind of hard to take a picture of, but you can kind of see these spines. And these can be six, eight, 10 inch spines. And this is why it's called a needle palm. This is what resembles a hedgehog. Are these, these sharp spines that are all around the base and you see them, you kind of see where they would be in here. So the leaves go out well beyond that, but if you come in, in close and this is some flowering you can see behind there, the flowers are held close to that stout trunk and often the seed will get caught in those, those spines there. There are some, some variegated forms, typically with all palms. If you get them variegated, they lose hardiness, they lose vigor. This is one called moonshine that has these streaky leaves in there. It is from a suckering form of needle palm. So occasionally it's available. Expect to pay a lot of money if you want that for a plant that doesn't grow terribly well and isn't terribly hardy, but you can sometimes find those. The beauties, completely different look than the other ones we were talking about. These have those feather-like or pinnate leaves on them when we get into the beauties. So beautia comes from a local Brazilian name for one of the species. And these are all from South America, from Brazil down into Argentina. They are all stout, kind of solitary palms. They keep their leaf paces. The male and female flowers are typically on the same plant, but they, they're separate on the same plant, separate flowering stalks on them. Capitata means head. It's got this nice head of foliage. This is called the jelly palm, and it gets that name because the fruit has about one inch or so yellow to red fruit, which can be really pretty tasty if you eat the coating off the fruit. It's sweet, but starchy. It's a... It's a it's unusual combination for uh, Westerners, I would say. Most all of the beauties have really stout, really sharp thorns on the sides of the petiole, the leaf stalk. One way you can tell, and this capitata has very nice long spines like that. But it'll grow, the trunk will grow to 15 feet tall or so, and then you get those fronds arching even higher, another five feet or, or, or more. There are some forms, this Beauty Capitata Compact Blue. I think this probably, there's a, a variant that has these kind of upright fronds. And I think Compact Blue is just a named form of this variant with these upright fronds. The Beautyas generally want, want good sun and excellent drainage. They do not tolerate wet soils for the most part. The needle palms, I kind of went by that. Needle palms grow well, sun or shade. They'll actually grow once established in, in wetter soils than a lot of other palms will tolerate. But I use them as shade plants generally. The beauties, beauties though, really want sun. Beauty capitata is a good zone 8 plant, 8B plant at, at least. Beauty yate, yate just comes from a native name for this palm. This is one of the taller beauties, grows to, uh, you know, 35, 40 feet tall, zone 8B. It's got those thorns on the side of the, the petiole, but they're not nearly as long as capitata. And that's, that's one way to distinguish the two plants. Beautia iriospatha is woolly space. That means iriospatha means woolly space, sometimes called woolly beautia. When these beauties flower, they have kind of this big covering on their flowers. The flowers will emerge from that. In Beautia capitata, that spathe is, is smooth and glaucous. In Beautia iriospatha, it's covered in these, these dark woolly hairs. 
And that's the biggest difference between it and Beauty Capitata. Irius Betha tends to be more green than the, have the blue tones of Beauty Capitata. Also, in my experience with Irius Betha, it's a little more shade tolerant than Beauty Capitata would be. And it grows to about 25 feet tall, about zone 8B. Beauty Catarinensis is one of the smaller of the beauties. This only grows to about maybe eight or nine feet tall about half the hot size of a lot of the other ones. Very finely dissected leaves. The leaflets on these fronds are, are quite widely spaced and, and quite pointy on there. This is perhaps the hardiest of any of the beauties. Doing really well in 7B. So this is one that, while not widely available, is one that I think palm lovers should be on the lookout for if you want to um, really try and stretch where you're growing your, your palms. There are some hybrids with beauties. So there's a hybrid, these are so-called mule palms. So beautia capitata, when it's crossed with Cyagoras romanzofiana, you get beautyagoras nabonandii, after Paul Nabanand, who was the first person who, who made this cross. They're 8B palms. They really are distinctive because they have these very, very long fronds they get from their Cyagoras parrot. Very, very stout trunks that they get from the Capitata. Quite unusual. And they have to be made by crossing the seeds from the Beautia and the Cyagoras, because the Beautyagoras, the, the hybrids are, as the common name mule palm implies, are sterile. They won't set more seeds. So you have to go back and do the original cross to be able to get this plant. There are other ones, Jubea and Beautias. There are some crosses with them as well. This is, I think in the, the chat, somebody mentioned Gary's Nursery down in New Bern, which sells palms. Uh, this is this is at the nursery, this Jubea by Beautia. And we find a lot of times with these hybrids that we do get even more hardiness and vigor than we would think otherwise. Well, something happened here. I think maybe I pulled up my wrong talk. Hold on just one second, because that should not have been the end of the talk. We certainly don't want it to end. Well... Um, well, while you're doing that, I just remember a fun fact. We had Gary from Gary's Nursery as a guest speaker many years ago, mm -hmm. and he made a comment that North Carolina has twice as many native palms as the state of California, and that would be the, the mainland part of California, not the little Channel Islands or uh, Catalina Islands, excuse me. I always thought that was pretty cool. You think California is the homeland of every palm, but uh, they just have one native and North Carolina has two. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. I did too. I am not sure what happened. Well, it was that computer gremlin we were talking about in the chat as well. <laughs> What's someone that? Had, said that was the computer gremlin that did something to it. We had someone that was having audio issues and I of course had Wi-Fi issues and now your last slides were taken away. Yeah, well, I had another couple of, well, three more genera to talk about. Let me see if I can pull up photos, some photos at least. They're not in the PowerPoint, but you know, just give me a second. I'll be there. And then I'm gonna have to try and remember what all these, which, which all these palms are. I, I didn't even realize it, but people have been commenting about liking your shirt and Ava just mentioned that it was a palm shirt. So it, 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 it was unintentional too. <laughs> all right, I've got a, I've got a, a few more. I've got a few images, so we will um, let me share my screen again. That Great. Be... So another another palm that is fairly hardy, although it's one that I struggle with. I think it doesn't like our humidity, even though it's got some good hardiness in it, but it can, it can grow here, is the Mediterranean camarops humilis. So cami means on the ground and rops, whenever you see R-H-O-P-S, means bush or shrub. So it's hmm. a shrub on the ground. This is another one like, like the needle palm. This is monotypic. There's only one species. Uh, so the Camerots humilis. Humilis means low growth. And this is usually a multi-trunk palm. It grows 
in Southern Europe and North Africa around the Mediterranean can be quite variable. Sometimes you get ones that have just a single trunk, but usually they'll have multi-trunks. It's really an 8D plant. All right, so there is a silver leaf form of it called Camerops humilis variety serifera. And this is it at Plant Delights Nursery. And this is one of the few cases where the showier version, the silver foliage one, is actually hardier than the green foliage one. So this one is, is more of a 7B plant, stays lower, but it will form those, those multi-stem trunk plants. Want sun, wants well-drained soil. They're Mediterranean plants, so they want that kind of dry, very quickly draining soil to really do their best. I grow some in a dry spot in lots of sun, but it's heavy soil, so it's dry, but my plant just doesn't thrive there. It's, it's kind of limping along, and I have a feeling that, you know, we have a real, another real rainy year, and, and I might lose it. It really wants that drainage, not just to be dry, but to, to have good drainage. So the next group is the Livestona, named for Patrick Murray, who was the Baron of Livingstone. This is about 28 species, mostly more tropical, but they go from North Africa, China, India, Southeast Asia, through Malaysia, New Guinea, Australia. So kind of in that Oceania, from North Africa and Asia to Oceania. They are solitary palms, usually have both male and female flowers on there. They haven't been trialed a lot, but I think they really deserve a little bit more evaluation. This is Livestona decipiens, which means deceptive or misleading. Some taxonomists are now putting this as decora, which means showy, so misleading or showy. This is called the weeping cabbage palm from Australia. And you get these finely, finely divided fronds that, that weep over really, really gracefully. The leaf bases remain on the, the trunks. It's easily a zone 8B plant. This is it growing in Columbia, South Carolina at Riverbank Zoo, where it has gotten to be quite a big plant and is, is, well, was still there last time I visited. And this is the plant that got me really interested in looking at more of these plants. So I started paying more attention to them. This is Livestona chinensis, which, you know, chinensis from China. It's called the Chinese fan palm, but it really, you're looking at Japan through the Ryukyus to Taiwan. Another one with broad leaves with these weeping tips with a real stout trunk. It's a zone eight plant at, at least. Now this one's kind of interesting. This Livestona cerebus. Now Livestona cerebus, that, that cerebus comes from the Malukan name for it, from the Malukan islands. It is generally considered to be, you know, 9B at best. I've been growing this for three years in my home landscape now, very protected spot right up against my house. But so far, it, it hasn't suffered a bit of damage. Now it gets to be a pretty big, you know, 70 foot tall tree and I've got it planted eight inches from my house. So I may be in trouble. It's got vicious spines on those petioles and my meter reader does not like it because the meter is right by this plant, but hey, what are you going to do? But you see, it's got the, the fronds on there almost all the way around the way the frondlets are, are distributed. I think, you know, quite a, quite a showy plant. There are other Livestonas, the Australian Livestona australis or Southern Australian fan palm. I'm not sure that the jury's still out on how hardy it's going to be, but I think it's got pretty broad distribution in Australia. And I think it, there's some possibilities for if it were collected in the right areas, it might be better. The last group that I'll mention are the the brahias, brahia or Hesper palms, brahia named for Tycho Brahe. So if you're a, a, an astronomy you know, lover, then, then you need to get your brahia. So you have something named for Tycho Brahe. The, the Hesper palms, there's about 16 species from just where you're talking about, Chris, from Baja, California, 
Mexico and Central uh, America. And these are the palms that if you go down through kind of indigenous areas in the, those areas, that this is the palm that has traditionally been used for thatching is the different brahias. So brahia armada is this blue one, the blue Hesper palm. Armada means armed and these petioles have, have little sawtooth edges all through there. Grows to about 35 feet tall with really stout trunks. It's a it's an 8B kind of kind of plant. Other brahias include this brahia nidida. Uh, nidida means shiny. You can see how it gets that that name here. Don't know a lot about this plant other than it's supposedly zone eight hardy, maybe even zone seven B. Have not have not grown it myself, so I'm not sure about that. There are other ones like Brahea edulis and Brahea calcarea that are, you know, 8B-ish kind of, kind of plants and other plants out there still to try. I mentioned the hybrid Judea jubea hybrid. The, there are some jubea that have some hardiness, at least 8B, and there's a para jubea coralii, which, which looks like it might be hardy. Something that hasn't been worked with a lot in the southeast and kind of warm temperate areas are those really deep south south american plants i mentioned the butea catarinensis which is proven to be one of the hardiest butias that's coming from southern brazil and so I really need to look into kind of the uruguay paraguay argentina and try those plants from known locations where we know the elevation we know how far inland we know kind of the cold temperatures they receive because i do think that there is there's probably more out there that we could be trialing chris questions that we have I'll try to get a few things. Thank you, Mark. I think we got a whole lot of the question. You, you definitely got even some of them too. We did have someone ask earlier, if we're going to talk anything about some disease problems with them, which I think we can even add to, to insect problems. I know Tim at the Arboretum has been spraying oil, horticultural oil on some of our palms for some scale. Yep. You get some general comments. I know Florida yeah. has uh, like lethal lethal yellow or something on palms, but I don't yeah. Think so it. the like the lethal yellows, you know, that are happening in down in Florida and places that are just killing the whole tops of palms. I don't really know about that. That's more of a subtropical problem. Our problems tend to be some scale that that palms get. Palm scale is a real problem, and. So yeah, horticultural oils are great. You can do dormant oils during the winter, do the lighter horticultural oils during the summer. Easiest to get those when the, uh, the young are moving. So if you hit them a couple of times in the spring and the oils are not, you know, those are smothering the, the, the insects. So they're not, it's not something that is gonna affect other plants. So you don't have to worry about that. There is, there is some, a lot of back and forth in palm circles about uh, the use of coffee grounds. Hmm. And I've read these articles where people swear up and down that coffee grounds will get rid of scale on palms. I've read other things that say that that is a bunch of hogwash. <laughs> I... Yeah. I dump my coffee grounds on my palms and I don't have any scale. I, <laughs> I don't know what that says. I did have some scale when I first planted them and it has gone away and I've done nothing but throw coffee grounds on there. We keep a little Tupperware container. I dump my coffee grounds in there and, uh, you know, once a week I take it out and put that on my, on, on my plants. And it seems to do, you know, seems to do something. I don't know. Um, that be proof right there, right, Mark? Right. <laughs> There's a question about the Bismarck palm, the Bismarckia nobilis. That is the one of the most absolute, most gorgeous palms in the world. It is these stout palms with these massive, massive leaves that are just silver. I mean, it is beautiful. It's it is a as far as, I don't consider it a hardy palm, but as far as non-hardy palms go, it's, it's probably about as close as you could get. I'll tell you what, if I could get my hands on a big one, like a, 
15, 25, 50 gallon one and didn't have to mortgage my house to do it and get it in this area, I would plant a big one and see if with that size, if it had increased hardiness. Because I really think of it as a 8A, 9B type of plant. But it is, it's beautiful. There was a what, oh. what zone would I rank? A question. Marilyn was wondering what you would rank our zone for the last couple of winters here in North Carolina. Yeah, it's, but we've been pretty eight, uh, eight A, eight B for the last last couple of years. Last winter was interesting. You know, it's these zones. People, you know, that's average annual minimum temperature. But there's so much more to it. A lot of these palms need really good drainage. So if you have a wet winter and you don't have great drainage, you're more likely to lose them. You know, this past winter was actually a, other than it was so wet, it stayed cold. It never got very cold, but it stayed cold all winter. So nothing tried to grow and then got nipped back. So, you know, the, the zone is a tool to help you, you grow what you want to grow, but it shouldn't be the only thing you look at. You shouldn't look at a, a list and say, up oh, zone eight, I can't grow that. Zone six, I can grow that. Because there are things that are perfectly hardy that don't grow well for us because of, you know, maybe heat during the summer or humidity. And same thing about winters. If you can really provide excellent drainage and but you know you have some good walls to utilize or some you know a good over you know tall understory of pines you can really stretch where you're going i have a a set of little battery operated thermometers that that i put out in different areas of my garden and i can read it all when i wake up in the morning i can look at what the highs and lows are in different areas of my gardens and really see these microclimates and so you can really play around with 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 microclimates but yes it's been very mild the last few winters for sure Marilyn is just now asking do sable miner and needle palm need excellent drainage no the sable miner grows in very wet soils. It'll grow anywhere. It'll grow in sand. It'll grow in bog. It'll grow in clay. Sable miners, just a super easy plant. The needle palms, they don't, they do naturally grow in kind of boggy-ish areas, but not as, not like sable miner. And I've, in the garden, I find that they do better if they're in a drier spot, but they can be in in shade. They don't need excellent drainage. They just don't want to sit wet. One palm that I didn't talk about is what was often just called uh, Sable brazoria from Texas. It's now officially Sable ex brazoriensis, and that's a, a trunked palm, but it's a shorter palm than Sable palmetto, but very, very hardy. But it does have a really stout trunk and a nice head, and it's it's one of the hardier, probably a 7B palm, and it's it's pretty widely available now, but Sable brazoriensis from the Brazos area of Texas. And the most frequently asked question in the chat, Kathy just asked it a moment ago, is what did you do to your hands? So oh I yeah, so I have, I did bilateral carpal tunnel surgery. So I will be, not picking up things for a couple of weeks, but then after that, I will never worry about carpal tunnel again. It is, um, I'm, I was promised it was cured once they did this to me. Yay. So that's what I'm doing. I didn't quite know how limited I would be, <laughs> but yes. Well, you're looking pretty yeah, good. Yeah, I did want to. Yeah, I, tell, I, I have been telling people that I'm doing, you know, doing some MMA, some <laughs> boxing, Muay Thai, kickboxing kind of thing. Yeah. Everybody laughs when I say that, though. So 
Any other questions? Questions about other palms? I think that takes care of it. There, there were a few people asking earlier about growing the palms in pots, and I did mention that they grow very well in pots. You just need to protect them in the winter time. Yeah. And, you know, really, a lot of our winters, a lot of these plants, you know, you could grow them in a pot, you could grow them outside with no protection. It's the, you know, the one week where things are bad. Yeah. But anytime you have things in a pot, you know, the, the roots are, are, a little bit more exposed so but but I grow things in pots a lot of times and I will keep them in containers and keep them out in the garden where I have them and then if it gets cold I'll drag them into the garage and once it warms up I'll just drag them right back outside the garage I won't put them back out in the garden but I'll put them where I can move them back in again and that's you know that seems to do just fine for, for a lot of plants like this. Marilyn um, just asked about what the hardiest, smallest palm is for this area. Okay, yes, there is, there is a, a plant called, God, do I, have, I might have a picture of it. Uh, there's a Camerops called Volcano, not, or it's V-U-L-C-A-N-O. -L it's not a sable, but that, that's a pretty hardy one. But the very hardiest, small plant is probably going to be one of the small sable miners, like sable miner Bluntstown dwarf would be probably the smallest. There's also a sable miner Wakula dwarf. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry about the cycads. I, I just, I ran out of time. We'll, we'll do those another, another time. Keep in mind, Mark is working a little bit slower at typing right now. <laughs> yeah. So there was a question about pindo palms. So yeah, those are the beauty of capitatas that I had mentioned, and and those are generally eight B hardy, eight A, eight B beauty capitata. That those are those are great plants. And here's something that I don't think gets said often enough. The especially with the pindo palms, the beauty of palms, that you know they're solitary palms, and sometimes in, at the end of winter that center spear will come out; it'll rot leave your plant in the ground for a while because sometimes they will recover from that. Um, huh. Beauties are especially known for that. And people will rip them out and they'll actually still be alive. So give them some time after a cold winter to let them come out before getting rid of them. That's good advice. Never, never heard that part. Yeah, I heard that part. I, I got that advice after I had done that to a big old one one time. And so ever since then, I, you know, I, and, I, and it, I have, it's been it's been true. Could that be what happened with the trachycarpus near the butterfly garden since it has so many shoots on it? So that one's always confused me. It's supposed to be a single trunk, but that one has many trunks on it. Yeah, I don't know if that was just damaged when it was young or or what. Uh, but you see that every once in a while they'll they'll do that, and I I don't know what what causes it. But yeah, it's kind of a neat plant for sure that it has those multiple trunks. Well, looks good. I think that takes care of all the questions in the chat, Mark. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And thank you, Mark, for a great presentation. All right. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry about the untidiness of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was still good. And I hope we'll see everyone tomorrow evening for a great talk with Scott and Daryl. It'll be at 7 o'clock. You can register with the link on our website. And again next week with our midweek program with uh, Doug. See you then. Thanks. See you, Chris. Thanks, Mark.